What do you look for in a crime fiction festival? Bestsellers? Prize winners? A new favourite crime writer? At Gwil Crime Cymru Festival in Spring 2023, we'll be offering all of these, but much, much more will be available, because the home of our festival is Aberystwyth, a little town with a long history and a big heart. Once home to Welsh princes, Aberystwyth is now home to the National Library of Wales and Aberystwyth University. The sweep of the town's Regency seafront pulls the tourists in from around the globe. Aberystwyth even offers the chance to watch dolphins as well as crime writers. Festival goers will be able to enjoy gourmet food and drink as well as delectable discussions of murder, mystery and mayhem. You will find live music in warm, welcoming pubs, as well as lively discussions on our festival stage in a former music hall theatre, with plenty of authors around for lively discussions of your own. Come and get cosy with the crime. There are hidden alleys and ancient byways to explore where murders might quite easily be hidden, and a funicular railway to take you to the top of Constitution Hill, where you can enjoy the camera obscura, and if you stay for a few days after the festival, you will be able to enjoy the breathtaking scenery of Ceredigion. The countryside and coast can be viewed by boat or heritage train, on foot and two wheels as well as four. Whether you love exploring lush river valleys, walking unspoiled beaches, or discovering the history of this beautiful area, Aberystwyth and Ceredigion have so much to offer. So come to Gwil Crime Cymru Festival next spring. You might just discover your new favourite crime writer, as well as your new favourite town. Good evening and welcome to this Gwil Crime Cymru Festival event. I'm Barry Forshaw. I'm the author of Crime Fiction, A Reader's Guide, and I'm the Financial Times crime critic. And we're able to bring you this event through the generous financial support of our Aberystwyth Town Council and Literature Wales. Now, one of the things that Crime Cymru Author Cooperative was set up to do was to promote new Welsh writing. So we're running short crime close-up shots, introducing new Crime Cymru members. Now, this evening's crime close-up author is Graham Miller. So over to you, Graham. Hello, right, yes. Um, I'm Graham H. Miller. I'm actually a self-published author. I'm from, well, you can tell from my accent, I'm not Welsh. I'm from Surrey originally. I now live in South Wales. I currently have five books available on Amazon spread across two series. One is the Angel and Haynes series, which is set in a fictional county. But tonight I'm going to read you an excerpt from The List, which is the first book in the other series, The Jonah Green Mysteries. Now, my character, Jonah Green, is a coroner's officer. For those of you who don't know, they're a police officer, but their entire job is investigating mysterious deaths and unexplained deaths. So it's a great character for me to write. And his first case, he finds a homeless person who appears to have frozen to death in the winter. And what he thinks is a routine case takes a twist with this scene where one of his other friends, who's also homeless, comes in to visit him. When they were sitting down with coffee, Jonah picked up his pen again. So, mister, he said with his pen hovering over the blank page, I'll give it a rest. I could give you a name for your form, but it doesn't matter. It's not like I've got an address or a phone number. Just call me Prof. When Jonah frowned, he continued. A lot of the people on the streets have problems, you know. They can't even read or write. I help them out if they need to deal with social services or the hostels or the DHSS. Anywhere they need forms filling in and such. So they call me the prof on account of my advanced education. He grinned wickedly. What happened to put you on the street, Jonah asked. What always happens, he answered with a shrug. Redundancy, wife left, money ran out. He moved his hand from side to side, floating down. It's like those shells and stuff that settle down through the sea to make chalk. One minute you're on the surface, next minute you're not. One event after another, it could happen to anyone. We're all a lot closer to the street than we think. You've never wanted to leave? Leave? Of course I bloody want to leave. But once you're past 55, and you're not employable, especially not without an address. 
and without a job, you're just a number on a waiting list for a halfway house or a place in a shelter. He gave a grim smile. Oh, I know the system. Fill in the forms. I'll find a place in a shelter for a bit sooner or later. He rubbed his hands together. Anyway, I'm sure you don't want me sitting here in your lovely office telling you my sob story. Although I could sit here all day and drink your coffee and keep warm. Certainly nicer than a lot of other places I could be. Okay then, Prof. I take it you knew Patrick. I'm sorry for your loss. Prof nodded. He came to see me about a week ago, give or take. Prof stopped and looked down at his fingernails. Thanks for your condolences, though I don't know if you mean it or not. I bet you didn't even know who he was yesterday. Prof took a deep breath. Patrick was all right, you know. Sure, we had his demons, and he liked his drink more than was good for him. There again, who doesn't? But he had a bit of learning, interest in the world around him. He could talk about what was in the news, read books when he could get them. He stopped again and stared out of the window. Anyway, about a week, maybe ten days ago, he came to me. He was quite agitated, a bit upset, but excited too. He said that if he was killed, I was to go to the police and hand you a piece of paper. He asked me because he wanted it done properly, with receipts and everything. Didn't want to go to all that trouble just to have you lot chuck it in the bin. Prof's hand disappeared into one of the large pockets on his grimy overcoat. He brought out a mess of paper, mostly small handwritten notes. As he sorted through the scraps of paper, Jonah's mind was whirling. Why had the prof just implied that Patrick was killed? Surely a homeless death in winter wasn't that exceptional. Meanwhile, the prof selected one piece of paper folded in four. He leant forward to smooth it out on the desk before handing it ceremonially over to Jonah. It was a page torn from a reporter's notebook, slightly grimy and with its top perforated. It had a list of seven names printed vertically down it in block capitals in Biro. There were two columns, one of three, the other of four. Emma Walters, Peter Calm, Bill Wormsley, Justin Day, Mike Kahn, Elizabeth Barry, Andrew McRae. Jonah turned it over. There was no more writing on the back. He turned it back to the front. He looked up at Prof. What's it mean then? Prof simply shrugged. I don't know. He seemed to think it would be obvious to you lot. It was his final request, if you like, only it was all done in advance, almost like he knew somehow. He stopped to consider the meaning of this profound statement for a couple of seconds. Can you do the paperwork now? Yeah, sure. Jonah gave the prof a proper receipt. Why did you come? Patrick said you were to come if he was killed. This looks like natural causes. Prof frowned and said, less than two weeks ago he was worried that somebody would try to kill him, and now he's dead. Just because it doesn't look like he was killed doesn't mean he wasn't. Um, yeah, and that's from my book. It's called The List, and it's available on Amazon. Uh, back to you, Barry. Thank you very much, Graham. And um, now it's time for the, the main event of the evening. When Alice Hawkins, she who must be obeyed, told me that I would have three heavyweight authors, uh, she wasn't exaggerating. These are three heavyweights. I mean that in terms of their gravitas rather than their body weight. So the panel tonight is called Where, When or Who, which is the most important question in crime fiction. So I have Mark Billingham, Philip Gwynne Jones and Mark Ellis. They are all distinguished crime authors who set their fiction in the past and the present in Britain and in Venice, featuring police officers and amateur sleuths. But what unites their books under the crime banner? What common factors do they share? And what might their work appeal? How might it appeal to different kinds of readers? Let's find out. Philip Gwynne Jones. And I'm asking Philip to come on screen as I'm talking about him now. Hi, Philip. Hello, buddy. Good evening, everyone. So Philip came to Italy to work for the European Space Agency in Frascati, a job that proved to be less exciting than he'd imagined, he tells me. He spent 20 years in the IT industry before realising he was congenitally unsuited to it, and he now works as a writer, teacher and translator. He lives in Venice, which is very impressive. He likes old horror films. I've written books about that subject, Phil. I, I, I knew <laughs> indeed, yes, yes. Mm. <laughs> and he, like, he listens to far too much Italian progressive rock listening to any italian progressive rock is too much isn't it phil well opinion is divided on it i mean <laughs> i say it isn't quite a lot of other people including my wife and my cat would disagree but yes <laughs> so phil is a bit caught now between um 
books. I asked everyone to tell me what their latest books were. So uh, The Venetian Legacy is his current one, but The Angels of Venice, book six in the best-selling Nathan Sutherland series, is out in July. So, Phil, wouldn't it have... Uh, wouldn't it be better to stay with IT rather a safer career than writing novels? Well, do you know, I still have what I call Unix nightmares, um, where I wake up and there's a problem which has to be resolved within 30 minutes. And I can still th remember some of my Unix and some of my database stuff. And I, it, the nightmare is always the same. I can't find a desk because everyone's hot desking and I've got 30 minutes to solve this problem. And then I wake up and I think, oh, I don't do that anymore. And that's a pretty good feeling. <laughs> well, it's funny because I'm going to talk to Mark B tonight. And I'm going to, for the, for the benefit of listeners, Mark B is Mark Billingham. Mark E is Mark Ellis. So I'll make it easier that way. And Mark B, I, I learned that we, he and I share nightmares. But the next person I'm in, introducing is Mark Ellis. Mark, would you like to bring yourself up there? Still with us, Mark. There he is. Hello, Mark. Yeah, hello. Hi, so Mark everyone. is a thriller writer hello. from Swansea and a former barrister and entrepreneur. In World War II, his father served in the Navy and he died a young man. His mother told him stories of watching the heavy bombardment of Swansea from the safe vantage point of a hill in Llanethi. I think that's the correct pronunciation. Yeah, I'd yeah, pretty good. Say pretty that good. with some good. hesitation to a Welsh audience. <laughs> and of attending tea dances in wartime London under the bombs and the doodlebugs. In consequence, Mark has always been fascinated by World War II. And we talked about this, have we not, Mark? And yeah. in, in particular, the home front. And the fact that while the nation was engaged in a heroic endeavor, crime flourished. Murder, robbery, theft, rape, and corruption were rife. And this is the harsh and cruel world of DCI Frank Merlin. So now we're talking about latest books. So the third novel in your historical detective series, Merlin at War, was on the CWA historical dagger long list in 2018. And am I right, Mark, that your latest is Dead in the Water? You are right, yes. Okay. So, Mark, is the world situation currently starting to look a little like World War II? Uh, it is. I mean, goodness me, yes. I mean, when I was writing, started writing these books, when I've been writing them all, all along, um, I thought I was creating a long-vanished world where people were under bombardment in cities in, in Western Europe. And now everything has slightly changed. And some of my books, I do touch upon uh, Stalin and Russia, and um, it's a very weird thing. I mean, I, 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 I perhaps feel that my book um, content is, is less unusual now. Mm. Very strange. Now, the final part of our trio tonight is a man who I have written about in several books. I think at least four. Mark Billingham, are you there, Mark? I'll wait for him to call himself up. <coughs> I'm sure he will. Any minute now. There he is. Hi, Mark. Hi, Barry. How you doing? So, Hi, Phil. Hi, Mark. Mark Billingham's novels have now sold... I think these, these figures may be out of date, so you can correct me, Mark, if I'm wrong. They've now sold over 6 million copies. He's had 21 Sunday Time bestsellers. Every one of his titles has been a bestseller. And he's spent over 126 weeks in the top 10. Sleepyhead, his first novel, which I remember covering donkey's years ago, has now sold in 30 languages and TV series, good ones have been made of Mark's books, uh, Thorn by Sky and In the Dark by the BBC. That's one of my favourite Mark Billingham books. And Mark himself has been uh, pro protean, have you not, Mark? He's been <laughs> protean. Have you ever been called that before? No, Barry, I'll take it. <laughs> he's been an actor, he's been a stand-up comedian, and now he's, he's one of the best thriller writers around. I wrote in Crime Fiction, The Reader's Guide, Billingham's breakthrough was inevitable. He made a considerable impression with the first two books in the Tom Thorne series, Sleepy Head and Scurdy Cat, novels that instantly marked him out as one of the most impressive writers on the overcrowded British crime scene. So am I right that Rabbit Hill is out now, Mark, and the murder book is out in June? Correct. So, Mark, do you ever miss your days as a thespian? Oh, God, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I miss stand-up sometimes. I miss, I miss the the buzz of those 20 minutes or half an hour on stage, I don't miss sitting around in grossy dressing rooms and driving up and down the motorway. I don't miss that. And I get those jollies at festivals and at events like this. As long well, as, I, as, long as I get a chance to show off somewhere, I'm all right. You do do a kind of stand-up act at Harrogate, don't you, with Val McDermott? That could be yeah. construed as a stand-up act. <laughs> Listen, open, open a fridge and I'm away. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't need, I don't need an excuse. 
So gents, the first question we have, because we've got to address three things, uh, uh, general questions, but where? So I'm going to ask you, Philip, first, how important is, it's a silly question, really, because I know the answer already, how important is locale to you when writing your books? It's kind of, it's almost everything, to be honest. Uh, people are passionate about Venice. Um, okay, we've got Donna Leon is out there, 30 books into the Brunetti series. Uh, that yeah, People who are passionate about Eurocrime, they love Venice. They want the city to feature in it. They want it to... to is the city a character? Well, it is a character because it affects the other characters, I suppose. They want the descriptions of the food, of the landscape, of the architecture, of the history. Um, I mean, I've talked about this before, saying one of my favourite crime novels is The Maltese Falcon. You don't get a massive impression of San Francisco in it. Not really, I would say. And so when I sat down to write The Venetian Game, I thought this is going to be 100% pure, undiluted Venice injected into your veins. You're not going to mistake this for any other city. And that is what a lot of people like about it. That is what they buy into, is, is Venice in particular. And the bizarre nature of writing a crime series in a city which is pretty much no violent crime. What about the fact that I remember saying to Peter James once, it was bloody brave of him to write a series set in Brighton when Graham Greene had written the definitive Brighton crime novel. Yeah. You've got a few predecessors, didn't Were you intimidated by that thought, film? Well, yeah, Donna Leon casts a mighty shadow. Um, Daphne du Maurier, of course, yeah. This is why I couldn't have my protagonist being, being, a, being, a, being, being a cop, being a policeman. Everybody would then say, you're copying Donna Leon, and you're not going to do it any better than Donna Leon. So I, I knew I needed to work around that some way. And of course, I'd only been living in Venice for about four years when I started writing these. And I wasn't sure I could write convincingly uh, as a Venetian or even as an Italian. But I thought I could make him a Brit. And then he took the perspective of the straniero in Venice. And I thought, well, I can write about that because I am one. And Nathan Sutherland came about because one of my students was the honorary consul for Thailand, one of my business students. And every week people would come to him with problems because they'd lost passports or maybe there'd be problems with the police. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. Immediately, that's kind of solved lots of my problems. People will go to him with problems. Right. How about Mark E is next up. Mark, you write about London, but it's not the London I live in, is it? So you have to constantly be reimagining London. Well, I'm, I'm where and when. I mean, it's, it's, it's 1940s London, it's the war. And um, obviously, um, to me, it's a wonderful place. I mean, that may sound strange because it was being bombed to hell and back. But I've completely immersed myself and uh, my family just say, you know, get out of 1940 or 41 or 42 and come into the modern world and let's discuss something. But I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Mm. And um, I spent a lot of time, obviously, reading books about wartime London. The thing about wartime London is that people have a slightly rosy idea in retrospect of uh, what London was like. Um, and even people think that, uh, you know, criminals took it, took it easy just, you know, to join in with the, the general war effort. Um, far from it. Uh, crime rose by about 60% between 1939 and 1945 in England and Wales. Um, there were vast new opportunities for criminals from the black markets, uh, forging, uh, ration books, goodness, goodness knows what. The blackout made crime very, very easy. The police were overstretched because they lost many of their best people to the armed forces. So it was a boom time. Gangsters had a great time. Uh, there was a guy called Billy Hill who features in some of my books who uh, run one of the biggest gangs. Um, and um, he always, he became the, 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 the king of the black market, amongst other things. And then there was the vice business, which was huge. Mm. Think about all the soldiers, the, the American soldiers, when they came into the war, the British soldiers swirling around, going well, it's in. It's interesting you the... mentioned the American soldiers. My mother used to say, she felt guilty saying how much she enjoyed the war. She said she was a young girl. There were handsome Americans everywhere, all right, the bombs were falling but she still enjoyed the war, but she felt slightly guilty about saying that. Well, my mother, yeah. my mother also went up uh, on the railway to uh, 
London for weekends. She worked for the railway, so she had free tickets. So she would go up for, and in those days, they could also stay for almost nothing in the yeah. Strand Palace Hotel. You know, she was a secretary in Llanetli. That's the exact pronunciation, Barry, Llanetli, okay? Just so you know. Llanetli, okay. <laughs> um, but, um, and yes, yes, and she was a good looking woman. And I, I know she had lots of fun with American officers, amongst others, although I didn't get the exact details. <laughs> but her, her sister in law used to tell me. Right. So Mark B. So Mark, when I'm writing the endless reviews I've written of your books over the years, I could actually just slot certain adjectives in. Uh, I don't think readers would notice, would they? But I always talk about your sense of locale, obviously your sense of character. So at one point you start thinking about locale when you're writing one of your Thorn books. Well, if, if with very rare exceptions, if it's a Thorn book, it's, you know, it's, it's taking place largely in North London. Uh, occasionally I'll do something really radical and send him across the river. Uh, I'm one, I've set one book largely, almost entirely on an island off the Flint Peninsula in Wales. Um, but that was very much a sort of fish out, fish out of water book. Uh, I was only ever going to write about London because it's where I was living. I'm not from London. I'm a Brummie, but I've lived in London well over half my life. And I think it's important to write about the streets you walk down, really. Uh, I think it's very difficult not to. Um, yeah, London is a character in as, in as much as what's very central to the books is Thorne's relationship with the city, which is a love-hate relationship, which yeah. I think is the only rational relationship you can have with a city like London. You know, he, it's, it's stupidly expensive and there's a lot of crime and parts of it are very dirty and it can be unpleasant, but you stand on Waterloo Bridge at night and look up and down the river and it's the best freaking city in the world. Uh, you know, and that is kind of reflected in him uh, but what I should say most importantly is that it is a city. I couldn't write about anywhere that wasn't a city. I couldn't write anywhere. I couldn't write about a rural community. I just only have to hear the theme tune to the Archers and I come out <laughs> in a cold sweat. Um, yeah, I agree I'm with you there, Mark. Not interested. I'm not in. It has to be a city. Are we all, well, to quote Philip, are we all Stranieri to a degree? Because I'm a Liverpudlian who's lived most of my life in, in London. You're a Brummie. Yeah. Um, Phil, yeah. you're living in Venice. What about you, Mark E? Are you a Stranieri? Well, I, I'm, I'm from Wales and I've lived most of my working life in London with a few sort of uh, variations. And I lived in New York and Los Angeles for a while, which was quite good fun. I'd like to write about Los Angeles in the 20s and 30s. I've always wanted to do that sort of, um, although some, some big people have been involved in that area. It might be yeah, a bit one or two. One or two. <laughs> So what do you think, Phil? Do you think it's it's quite a good thing to give us that sense of perspective by being, I feel like a Londoner more than I do a Northerner nowadays, but I'm still a Northerner. Well, first of all, can I say I quite like the Archers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll let you have that one. Okay. <laughs> but I could, I, but actually, like Mark, I could never write anything which isn't in even a modest-sized city like uh, uh, like Venice. Uh, yeah, being the outsider, being the person kind of looking in on it, I think... It was immensely useful. <coughs> I, I don't think I could have written a protagonist who was a Venetian, not an Italian, but an actual Venetian. Um, because, yeah, oh, people, we've, people. we've upset him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was about to have a cough, coughing fit. So it's, <laughs> it's all right, you've missed nothing. <laughs> so again, so going back to you, Mark B, so it, it, do, you, do you now feel like, well, you have places in, in America. Do you still live in America as well as Britain? Sometimes. So you're a bit of a stranger. You're a, you're a stateless person, Mark. State, <laughs> I, yeah, I know. I mean, I, I probably feel as much a Londoner as much, as much as anything. But one of the things that's interesting to me, because something Phil just said, even though we're going about, on about how important places, and, and every crime writer always talks about a sense of place and location and the, it's a character and all that, but you mentioned the Maltese Falcon, which is also pretty much my favourite crime novel. Uh, and I think that just goes to show that you can write a perfectly wonderful crime novel without any sense of place at yeah. all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Yes, yeah. if you go back to, to history, James Hadley Chase writing No Orchids from Miss Blandish, and he'd never into the States. Right. Everyone assumed he was yeah. an American, right? So Mark E. Now, when, the next question is when? Now, this we're going to get different answers from, from the three of you now. So when, when you're writing about a a particular period of British history, how much research do you feel you should put in or do you try to make it invisible, the research? Well, I think it's this sort of delicate, delicate balancing act in which you don't want to be uh, 
acting like a professor teaching people about things that happened in the war. By the same token, you throw in a few interesting facts which um, engage people. So um, I do a lot of research, obviously, and I spend a lot of time on the specific um, the specific period of the books, because obviously uh, the books are like in a month of a certain year, and whether it's 1941, 1942, or whatever. And, and um, I throw a lot of things in, and then I take them out when I'm editing. That's the answer to your question. Okay, that's a good answer. So Mark B., Mm. You're, you're writing about modern London, yes. which changes as it's changing outside this window as we speak. Yeah. London's yeah. always in a state of flux. So it are is. You, are you ever worried that your books will become a kind of time capsule because you put too much specific detail in? Oh, I, I mean, I've, I've put less and less specific detail in as time goes on, uh, book on book. I mean, I, I've become slightly afraid of research, very wear, wary of it. Um, because you can do too much, exactly as, as Mark just said, you know, we, we don't want to be those writers who find all lots of stuff out and then crowbar it into the narrative. Here's all the stuff I found out, now you're bloody well going to know about it. We've all read books like that. Yeah. Um, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. And um, certainly if, it, if you're, you know, if you're setting in something in, a, in, in the past or, or in the future, wherever, it necessitates a good deal of research, which frightens me. I wrote a book about, just only about three years ago, set in 1996, a prequel to Sleepyhead. And that involved enough research, just going back to 19... Even though I remember it, it still mm. felt like I was writing a historical novel, except instead of handsome cabs and statues, there were mobile phones and big mobile phones and take that splitting up and mad cow disease. But, it, you know, that that involved enough research, just going back going back a couple of decades, you know? I, um, I knew a, a Welsh crime writer some years ago. He's long dead now. His name was John Williams. A not uncommon name, I believe, in Wales. And he was told by publishers at the time, this was a question for Phil, really, that nobody believes there's any such thing as crime in Wales. <laughs> and if there is crime, it's going to be cosy. Um, so how would you feel to be writing about Wales, Phil? That would be interesting. And I'd like to do it one of these days, I suspect. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, I hadn't really written anything very serious before coming to Venice. This is the big thing. Venice kind of changed my life. It got me out of Unix and databases and terrible, terrible memories of the past. And it gave me another chance with writings, but I hadn't really read, written very much before that. Um, the first thing I wrote um, was a review of a Hawkwind gig. <laughs> um, yeah, it gets worse, Mark, yeah. Mark, was, Mark Billingham was probably at that gig. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, was role, been. it was for a role-playing fanzine, and I tried to write it in the style of Michael Moorcock. Um, <laughs> I, I, just, I still think it was pretty good, but... There's a there's a thirty year gap between that and um, and the Venetian game, um, so yeah, well, I would very much like to try writing something in Wales, um, but th that would be a side project I suspect because I'm in Venice and you know, we talked about walking the streets and things like that. This is something I do every day. You're out there in this weird city, which has gone off on its own tangent because of course there is no there is no motor traffic to speak of beyond boats. Uh, and you walk these streets, which, you know, the city is 1,600 years old. You feel the history everywhere you go, whether it's like Renaissance period Venice or 1920s fascist Venice. There's this immense weight of history everywhere you go, and there is so much there to really explore and exploit. And if you just look up, you'll see a feature on a building and you'll think, you know, there might be a story in that somewhere. Well, haven't you made a rod for your own back because you've talked about Hawkwind, but Venice is the city of classical singers and classical music. Oh. Uh, it's the city of Monteverdi. And, um, it, it and, is. But I, and I, Donna I, Leon has explored that territory. She has, yes. I mean, I did write a book set at the opera, which was my attempt at doing a, a Phantom of the Opera type story, I suppose, which was about a lost Monteverdi opera. And um, it was called The Venetian Masquerade. I wanted to call it Choose Your Masks which is a Hawkwind <laughs> album. And my editor said, no. <laughs> too, too esoteric. <laughs> no, you're not doing that. <laughs> so Mark E, uh, we're going back to when, that question. How yeah. do you avoid a kind of warm nostalgia about the wartime years? Because they were tough years. Well, I, 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 that's what I'm trying to avoid is nostalgia and, and to go into the, the depths of what used to go on, um, what crime, the crime that used to go on. Um, I was just sort of, I have to mention that, um, sorry, going to the previous question, I do have some Welsh elements in my book, but they tend to be sleazy, unpleasant characters. I don't know why I'm doing that. 
I have a character called Maury Owen who's, um, who runs a Soho, a sleazy Soho club. And um, at some point, I, I have to say for the viewers from the festival that I must have some good Welsh characters coming in. <laughs> and I do hope at some point to have um, uh, Inspector Mer uh, uh, Frank Merlin going down to Wales to investigate something, maybe in a small town, because I can oh. imagine a small town murder, you know. Well, as you brought up the Welshness angle, uh, Mark, I'm going to ask the two Welsh people on this panel a question. I've asked Ian Rankin the equivalent of this. We really like the Scots, but they don't seem to like us. Is that true of the Welsh as well? Do you well, like the English? Of course we do. We love the English. We love the English, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on, Mark, um, put your answer I, to that well, one. I've, li I've lived most of my life in England, so of course I, of course I love the English, except... Uh, on the on the few occasions when they beat us at rugby and things like that, <laughs> it, it happened once, I think, but we don't like to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but the other point out, the other question. point out that a I'm a quarter Welsh. <laughs> uh, well, there we are, <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm married to a Welsh speaker. I'm married. There to you a, are. Yeah. So oh, yes. uh, there's I a lot, lot of Welsh goes on in our house. <laughs> you speak to Alice afterwards. You can talk about paying your subs for crime comedy, then, Mark. And oh, okay. <laughs> I, I wish I'd not mentioned it now. <laughs> how is how is your Welsh, Mark? Then, Mark B. Oh no, it's not good. It's really not good. She tried when I um even doing a Welsh accent. So this book I wrote called The Bones Beneath, it was set on Bardsey Island. Lo obviously, a lot of Welsh characters in the book. And I narrate my own audiobooks. And that was the only time I've actually brought my wife into the studio with me, who just sat in the corner. And every time my Welsh accent started to wonder, she'd just go, you know, stop, we need to do that again. <laughs> I can really, see, really like, hard accent. I could think like groom as thing as you do it. Oh, so she the... was. She was. No, my, my attempt at speaking Welsh is just a horror show. But Right. As I just proved by trying to pronounce a couple of Welsh place names. But I'll, yeah. I'll get better. I'll try. So, gents, the third question on our panel today, we've talked about when... We talked about where, and now it's who. So, Mark B, do your protagonists always have to be difficult bastards? Um, no. I mean, uh, well, I guess whatever kind of bastards they are, whether they're nice bastards or difficult bastards, they have to be the hero of their own story. Um, you know, however vile their acts might be, however, you know... Um, nice they are, they still have to be completely well-rounded and convincing characters, which means inhabiting them for a bit, uh, which, you know, gives me a bit, of, a bit of an acting kick. I just like to get inside the heads of these characters and walk around in their shoes for a bit. Um, every, every character you write has to be convincing. I mean, it, it is the one thing that will make me put a book down, uh, notably how a character speaks. You know, for me, dialogue is, is everything, and I can read a book where the, the author has the most fabulous turn of phrase in the way they can describe a lush landscape or whatever it is but if, they, if they've got a tin ear for dialogue i'm not interested i think dialogue can do can do everything um, you've in fact put yourself in the mind of a of a, some psychopathic characters was that even more yeah. difficult um no no really not i mean which <laughs> which may say something about me but absolutely <laughs> not um you know I, I i certainly know the difference you know, I've, I've, you know, I have had encounters with real psychopaths, right. and and you know, it really puts it into perspective. You do realise that making them up is is fairly easy by comparison. Um, no, and you know, the devil has all the best tunes. They're usually the most fun characters to write. You know, what about you, Phil? Have you uh, do you inhabit your characters? Do you give them your own characteristics? Well, Stephen King said, didn't he, that every character you write is kind of a part of you. Now I don't know. I mean, people say. People say to me, oh, you're basically Nathan Sutherland, aren't you? And I said, well, no, he's he has a slightly more unhealthy lifestyle than I do, which is not to say I have a healthy lifestyle. Um, but basically, he likes the same things that I do. Now, why do I do that? OK, well, I'm going to spend nine months a year on this guy's head. He's not going to be a Justin Bieber fan. And also, pe people thought, actually, what a very early review of Venetian Games said, I was very, very carefully making fun of the Italian predilection for terrible old 1970s rock bands. And I thought, I'm not making fun of this at all. I'm absolutely <laughs> serious about this. <laughs> and I would be delighted if at the end of a book, somebody thought, well, this Hawkwind band sound quite good. I'm going to go and listen to something like them. But <laughs> I've never thought of you being a press agent for Hawkwind, but there we go. <laughs> I'm doing so, that. So, so yeah. Marky, uh, this, this thing of putting yourself in the mind of your characters, I once did a, an email, not an email interview, it was a postal interview with Umberto Eco when he'd written The Name of the Rose. And he admitted that setting a book in a medieval monastery was a cheat because you never know the way people from the past really thought. I know the Second World War is more 
uh, nearer to us. But it's still a bit of a stretch to get into the mindset of someone from the 1940s, isn't it? Well, I, I suppose um, it is difficult to think of Frank Merlin liking Hawkwind. But, um, <laughs> it would have been uh, uh, Glenn Miller and no, um, no, no, Harry Yes, I, I, I do put in some musical uh, favourites of mine as, as favours of him. I mean, I, to a certain extent, I mean, one has to be careful about this because he's my main character and I've now written five books about him. One can get rather lazy about doing your main character. You lay out the same things and... Someone commented the other day that he was getting a bit, you know, too happy. And, you know, so I've probably got to do something to make him unhappy, uh, you know, in the next book or the next book and one. But um, I, my, the most exciting thing for me as I go along is writing the villains and the bad guys and, you know, writing something in uh, wartime London. There are plenty of bad guys and, you you know, in the background you've got uh, the Nazis and God knows what, and I throw a few of them in too. And um, I always so you get follow really the... Um... You follow the Hitchcock idea. Hitchcock said I was always he was always more interested in his villains than his heroes. Yes, uh, well, yes, in a way, yes, of course. The, the the nasty people are more interesting than the nice people. I think so. Well, maybe maybe I should make my nice people a bit nastier. You know, I have to work <laughs> on that. We're still on the question of who, Mark, Mark B. Mm. So Sebastian Fawkes recently said he was no longer going to be writing about women because he felt that it was no longer ac acceptable for male writers to put themselves inside the consciousness of women. Presumably it works the other way around, so women can't write about men. Are you a subscriber to that theory, Mark? What do you think, Barry? Uh, <laughs> I already knew the answer. <laughs> um, I think it's preposterous. I think it's absolutely preposterous. It's pretty much the death of fiction uh, as a concept. Um, no, no, I mean, my, my latest book, Rabbit Hole, is entirely in the first person from the point of view of a, uh, a northern woman in her 30s. Um, and I reserve the right, I'm afraid, Sebastian, uh, to write about anybody I flipping well choose to write about, whether that be a 12-year-old boy or a 95-year-old woman or what. That's kind of what making stuff up is about. And I like the way you hesitated before that adjective that began with F. And you made it, it flipping well. You know, uh, it, it is it it is just it is just ridiculous. And if all, if the books we wrote were just about white middle aged men, yeah. they would they would be a dollar's ditch water, and really would not kind of be reflective of the world we live in, uh, or even the world we're writing about. So no, I mean it's uh, it's nonsense. I, I can see the two other panelists nodding their heads. So Phil, are you intimidated now with the new the new regime whereby? You really have to be from a particular background to write about I that. I was character. just thinking, if only Bram Stoker had been a real vampire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would um, Patricia Heist... Well, where would be with that Patricia Heist? Yeah. 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 Actually, my, my next book, I mean, there's a, as Marky was saying, that yeah, you know, that next one is entirely first-person female character. Um, my next one, Angels of Venice, 10 weeks, folks, coming up. Um, there's a, you know, a second-person narrative from a female narrator in that for a short part and I think it's what you have to do isn't it you know otherwise what have I got I've got you know a, a, you, half the population of the world I suddenly can't write about it this is nuts <laughs> well in fact Mark E you're the luckiest of the three here because if anybody criticizes things in your books you can say well that was a different era and <laughs> well, yeah no no yes but I, I did I in this my, in my latest book I have um the Americans are in town, and of course, the Americans imported um, their own race relations from 1940s America, which were pretty appalling. And our own race relations, we didn't have that many people, uh, black people in this country. So the race relations were, uh, you know, I'm not saying they were perfect, but they were nothing like all the, the facts of all the American white soldiers would go to dance uh, dances or pubs and they would object to black people being there and in due course an element of segregation and you may have noti noticed I stuttered a little bit on using the word black because you never know yes. which word you yes. can use these. so I, I was quite cautious about my wording yeah well I have to say to you that in the paper I write for the Financial Times I talked recently about black crime talking about writers like S.A. Cosby and so many very good black American writers yeah. the paper was a little worried about the use of the word black and I said well no it's a, <laughs> it's a description it's a simple yeah. description of black crime writers writing about black crime. So, so yeah. Phil, do you feel constrained in any other way? For instance, do you feel constrained about class when you write about class? You're living a fairly in an elegant lifestyle in Venice, are you not? <laughs> I 
teach English to shouty kids when I'm not writing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's all gondolas here, mate. Yeah. Um, do I feel constrained about writing things? Um, class is an interesting thing, perhaps. My protagonist, Nathan Sully, is a regular guy doing a fairly regular, if slightly unusual job. Class doesn't really come into it. In terms of being constrained or writing about stuff, um, you know, I've got lots of Italian friends now, and I'm writing about their city and the city where they've grown up and where their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers lived. I would hate them to feel I was being disrespectful to the city. I would feel really bad if they thought that some foreign bloke has come in and has used their city as a cheap backdrop for a grubby little crime novel. Um, and it's an staggering amounts of money on the back of it. I would feel horrible about that. So I do try to treat the city with respect and Italy with respect, because Italy has really given me another life. Right. But at the same time, there are things you can't ignore. You know, you can't ignore that there is organised crime. Yes, and uh, fairly, fairly endemic and, corruption. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of that. You know, there is so much of that. You know, ridiculous projects that drag on and cost huge amounts of public money. You can't ignore that. You have to confront it. Um, so, yeah, I don't want people to think I'm not showing respect to the city. I love this city. But you have to be honest about this. And I think um, the, if the honesty wasn't there, people wouldn't respect it, perhaps. Yeah. Mm. So, Mark B., I mentioned class. And I'd say that anybody who'd read your novels, as I've done over the decades, would get a, a wonderfully rounded picture of London and modern society. Uh, but do you see yourself as a... Are you a social commentator or are you just an entertainer? Uh, if you set out to be a social commentator, you're going to write terrible books. Well, you're certainly going to write terrible crime novels. You know, you can't have an agenda. You can't go, this is my book about this issue. Here's my book about this issue. The story has to come first. If within that, uh, you, can, you can shine a light on a certain issue here or there, then, which crime fiction is perfectly placed to do. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned class. Class doesn't matter to a copper, you know. Uh, a copper can go anywhere and open yes. any door. Yes. Uh, that that's what makes a copper the perfect protagonist in a way, and that's what makes crime fiction ideally placed to be uh, socially aware fiction, or indeed the fiction of social commentary, if it so chooses. Um, yeah. But but that cannot be, you know, the prime directive. I mean, you take take a show like Columbo. Columbo, greatest cop show of all time. Feel free to argue with me, but you're wrong. Um, it, for, to me, is a show about class. Yeah. You know, you have, if you think about all the classic Columbos, all the classic villains, they're architects yeah. and, uh, you know, classical t uh, composers and TV oh, chefs. And, yes. Yeah. And they all est underestimate this working stiff, you know. Well, Patrick uh, and I McGoom kind of, will always play one of those characters. You'll have Patrick McGoom playing the head of a military academy. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. always about. Yeah, no, but I mean, that, that's one of the things I love about that show. But yeah, um, you know, I, I think a lot of crime writers are are writing what will be looked back on as social commentary and what will be looked back on as a great way to look at how society has changed in, in various cities around the world. Um, but I don't think that's what those writers set out to do. I think they just set out to tell a bloody good story, you know. Well, you made a good point about the, the, the detective could go anywhere. And if we think of the opening lines of The Big Sleep, when Marlowe says, I was calling an $8 million, because yeah. he can. Yeah. It doesn't matter what background he's from, he can call an $8 million, and they have to listen to him, don't they? Yeah. So it's different for you, Mark E, isn't it, slightly, in terms of class, because the class system was probably more hidebound in the Second World War. It's broken up. For instance, look at the way the Queen spoke, those early recordings of the way she spoke, which yeah. didn't even sound like English. And now she yeah, tries yeah, to... Yeah. And look yeah. at the way her, her offspring... Now she's been. all gore blimey this, and, you know, <laughs> she's down the street. Street. She's gone really <laughs> street, the Queen. <laughs> well, yeah, so uh, inevitably my stories take me from the, the, the top to the bottom, the, the Soho club owners to the... Yeah, there's some posh people in my books too. I can't say I particularly focus on class problems. I'm just focusing on interesting crimes and who commits them and um, how Merlin can solve them. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to make any social commentary at all. I'm just uh, portraying London at a particular time as a background to ordinary people, an ordinary detective getting on with solving crimes. Well, in a few minutes, Louise is going to take over for the questions, but I'm now going to ask all three of you to tell me about your next book, starting with you, Philip. 
Right. I don't, I don't want any of this. It's too early to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. The Angels of Venice is set. You probably remember this because it made international news. The night of the Aqua Grande in November 2019, the worst flooding the city has had in 50 years. Um, the streets, you know, water wasn't just rising up through the streets. It was roaring along the streets. There was an incredible amount of damage. Uh, the city was basically on its knees, certain areas without power. And I thought, my goodness me, it would be a good night to commit a murder. And that's pretty much what happens. Okay, that's quite a good start. Mark E, your next book. Well, I, I am literally just starting, Barry, so I don't have a very developed plan. I don't write, I don't work to a developed plan. I just kick, I do my research. The next book is going to be the, 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 the new book that's just coming out is set in August 1942. The next one's going to be spring 1943. I'm researching it, finding out some interesting things. I have a rough idea of possibly members of the royal family involved in a gay sex ring, which might have some actually historical yeah, okay. background, but I can't yeah. tell you exactly yet. Something well, I, happen, like, I happen to know that Mark Billingham's next book is actually set in a cosy retirement village <laughs> where a group of elderly pensioners get together. Is that right, Mark? And You're giving it away now. It'll, it'll never sell. It'll never sell. Nobody will have that. No. And there's a there's a young wizard as well at a wizard school <laughs> as a subplot. Um, my next book, which is out on June the 9th, is called The Murder Book and sees the return of one of Thorne's oldest friends and uh, his very worst enemy. And it draws a line under quite a lot of things in Thorne's story, which is... One of the reasons why Thorn is taking a break and uh, there won't be any more Thorn for a couple of years because the book after that, which is just I've just delivered, is a new series, start of a new series. Uh -huh. which well, is... I was going to ask him because Michael Connolly lets his detective age in real time. Yeah. Uh, you've, you've done the same. Not quite, not well, quite as cheated, accurately as Michael. Slightly, <laughs> yeah, I've fudged it a little bit. Um, <laughs> but but no, I'm starting a new... I mean, you know, Thorn isn't going to die or retire or anything. I'm just taking a break to write something a lot lighter and more more obviously funny, which is going to signal the end of my career. But there we go. Could be. Uh, it's done. So yes, we'll when James Patterson wanted to write a romantic novel, they allowed him to publish it, <laughs> and, and it sank without trace. Are you saying I'm being indulged by my <laughs> publisher, Barry? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> You're probably right. You're probably right. I mean, I remember Patricia Cornwell writing a sort of humorous novel a few years ago that was interesting. Um, but I, you know, I come from a comedy background and I've always sort of fought shy of that. The book, my, my books have got, I'm sure everybody's books have got humour in them. They, they have to, right? You have to have dark humour in there. Yeah, but the, yeah. the new series will, will uh, be going for that big time. So my final question before I hand over to, to Louise. So Mark E, here's my question for you. I once asked P.D. James, was there any pressure, because she was published by Faber from 1964 onwards. It was still a bestseller. <laughs> Was there ever any pressure from editorial uh, aspects to change things in her books? And she said to me, I would walk if they ever tried to get me to change my work. What would you do if an editor asked you to change your work, Mark? Um, I don't know. If it meant I sold 100,000, you know, or something like Mark Billingham, a million, <laughs> I'd probably say, fine, no problem. But I don't <laughs> think necessarily think the editorial side will be able to tell me that. No. So far, they've made no, no. Um, you know, they seem quite happy with it, and they, 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 they're tinkering with the covers at the moment. That's the main thing, and, and yes, titles no. indeed. Cover, covers are important. So, Philip, when, when your when your publisher says to you, "We'd like you to set something in Calabria," are you happy with that? Um, I think that might be quite difficult, actually. Um, I'm, they're very keen on me staying in Venice for the moment, but on on terms of editorial. Um, interference shall we say my lovely editor christina green said to me on delivery of the second book there is far too much of the cat there is far <laughs> too much of the protagonist <laughs> cat and then of course people started i've made a rod for my back with the cat because the cat is the most popular character and being a cat there is kind of limited what he can actually do but nevertheless about 12 months later over dinner one night she said to me yeah okay i was wrong about the cat <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, <laughs> she saw the error of her ways. So what would you do, Mark, if, it, if they ever came to you, Little Brown? Well, and they do. I mean, and I, have to, I have to say, I think Phyllis was probably being a little bit mischievous with you, Barry, because <laughs> her books would not have been as good as they were if they hadn't been edited. No. <laughs> uh, there, there isn't a writer alive who doesn't need editing. Um, and, you know, for every 10 edit notes, you might knock two of them back or three of them back and dig your heels in. But most of the time, your editor is telling you something you kind of suspect anyway. You know, a little voice in your head going, oh, those three chapters are just treading water in the middle or, you know, I'm still not sure about that character. God, we all need editing. And so uh, I, occasionally there are battles about, but they're always about things like jackets and titles and, you know, it's not really about the content of the book. And, of course, we all, at the end of the day, have that control. We all have that control, which you don't have in film or television, yeah, where it pretty much is down to you at the end of the day, and you can say yes or no. But most of the time, you say yes if you're sensible. Yeah, if you're well, sensible. I suppose the object lesson is, is The Great Gatsby, isn't it, which is twice as long before the editor, Maxwell Perkins, got to work on it, <laughs> and he produced The Great Gatsby that we know now. So, Louise, are you ready to go with the questions? <laughs> yes, thank Hello. you. Hello. <laughs> really interesting chat and lots of questions um, for you. So I'm going to start because we've considered um, lots of things that you would think about in terms of perhaps you know sensitivity readers. Um, but one which is probably quite close to my heart is how do you avoid the men writing women syndrome, <laughs> um, which there's a great Twitter thread um, uh, which picks out little bits from books uh, and is very, very funny. Mostly, you know, it's to do with a fascination with breasts. But how do you, and maybe I'll start with Phil, how do you avoid that? And um, do you have met, do you write Phil. from a female point of view very much? Um, I have done, I have done. And, but it's not the, uh, the main, the main protagonist obviously is a man, but there is a, a the secondary character, if you like, is female. Um, how do I, you do it with great care, basically. Um, I've, I've never gone off on a breasts kick, if, if I can, if I can call it that. <laughs> um, I, I just said that, didn't I, to an audience? Yeah. 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 yeah great. Well, yeah. um, <laughs> I don't really go in very much for physical description. Um, I, I, cause I think characters look like you want them to look. Um, I have an image. I know what they look like myself. Um, but that's it. And... It's difficult. I don't have a sensitivity reader. Maybe I should. Um, nobody's actually come back to me and said, this is completely unrealistic and women do not behave like that. So I, I kind of hope I, I've got that right. Um, but it's, uh, you, you can't write a book which is exclusively male. You know, it's, it's you, you, you have, you know, it was, it was absolutely vitally important for me. My, my favourite character in the books is probably Federica, who kind of evolved out of nothing. Basically, she was there as a art consultant for one scene in the first book. And then I thought, oh, you're fun. I quite like you. And I like the relationship you've got with Nathan. OK. And it all built up from there. And that she was really a character that just came to me when I was writing her. I hope I've got her right. And that's all I can say really on that. <laughs> read her yes you have definitely oh, thank yes. you. no thank no you. worries there <laughs> uh, mark mark b mark b mark e, mark e, well, mark I, mean, b. I mean i just i just echo what phil said it's kind of you either write a character well or you write them badly uh it doesn't really matter whether it's a man a woman a child an old person um you're trying to write a character and, and like phil i don't go too much for physical description because i think that's doing the reader's job for them you know they can put the flesh on the bones i'm much more interested in the character's voice and you know, I, I wanted to get Alice in Rabbit Hole, who, who you spend the whole book with. I just wanted to get her voice right. What she looked like was neither here nor there. Um, and she's certainly not going to spend hours like some of those writers you're talking about who get shown up on Twitter staring at herself in the mirror and examining herself and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I'm married to a woman. I'm the father of a woman. I, you know... I'll have a fairly good go at trying to write as convincing a female character as I possibly can. Um, and I, 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 I hope the, the, the writers you're talking about who do get highlighted are in the minority. I think they are. Oh, I think yeah. they are, you know. They, they are definitely, yeah. My heart always sinks, though, when, when um, a character starts looking at themselves in the mirror. Right. <laughs> so, no, right. Who does that? <laughs> Move on, <laughs> move on. Nobody <laughs> just stands there and goes, well, I'm wearing mm. it. Uh, um, Marky? 
Um, well, um, I don't have I don't have many breasts. I don't think I have any breasts in my <laughs> books. Actually, just thinking about it, I, yeah, I, mean, I fully agree with the other two. Um, I, I have two two quite sort of prominent recurring characters um, in my books. One is a, um, a det detective constable in Scotland Yard, so that's quite you know innovative that she's there. Uh, she's there by pulling strings because she's the door uh, the, the niece of the uh, deputy assistant com the assistant commissioner. And I, I base her on people I think of and I know. And then I have uh, Merlin's now wife, who's a, who's a Polish refugee. And um, they're, they're not complex characters, but I just I just write them like I write the male characters. I don't really see any big difference. I think you can switch it around, actually. I think often I'm sure there are women writers who write male characters badly yeah. as well. So I don't think um, I think it probably works either way. Another question which comes from Bev is that Mark B's books have been adapted, but who would Phil and Mark E like to see play their characters on screen? Ooh. Do you have anybody in mind, Phil? You want to go first, Mark? Well, unfortunately, because I'm stuck in the 40s, it would have to be someone like Ray Milland or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not around anymore, Mark. A, 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 Thank a you on that. Yeah, I don't know if many people know that Ray, Ray Milland was, in fact, Reginald Trussell Jones. Yes, he's Welsh, isn't he? Yeah. So um, uh, uh, there are there are there are like a list of sort of current act. I'm not the trouble is I'm not very much up on the current acting scene. Um, I, I, I know someone called Nat Parker um, uh, as a friend, but he's already done one of the other characters on the telly. Can't remember which one. Now. Nathaniel Parker. Yeah. Yeah. He who did, played um, um, Inspector Elizabeth, Lindley. Yeah, Elizabeth George yeah. character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually looks rather like my character, so. If he, he doesn't want to be too typeset, he could do it. Phil has clearly been thinking who he wants to play his character. <laughs> well, if, um, am I allowed a time machine? Yes. Um, yeah. Because no, it's got to be somebody living. It's got to be Gary Oldman. Oh, okay. if, if I'm allowed a time machine, I want William Powell and Myrna Loy from The Thin Man. <laughs> um, but if I can't have them, uh, oh, my goodness. I always keep coming back, actually, to the same two names, which are Michael Sheen and, because I love him, we all love Michael Sheen so much. And uh, and David Tennant. It's just that sort of kind of lightness of touch, being light on his feet, thinking he can talk his way out of a situation, even if he can't necessarily do that. But the um, Welshness have something to do with that, Phil. Um, well, Nathan, I think, is actually where you want him to be from. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he can be Welsh if you want him to, but he doesn't have to be. I I'm, I'm right. still haven't filled in his early years as yet. Um, but to be honest... If it ever gets made, I'll be delighted with whoever they choose. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this question is from Alex, and it's to the the two marks. Our marks times two. Um, if you were to swap, what would Mark E like to write about in the modern world, and what would Mark B do with World War Two? Mark. Uh, shall okay. I go first? Mark okay. E, yeah. Well, probably I would like I would like to I would probably write a detective series set in Wales, yeah, in Swansea. I, yeah, I come from Swansea. I'm very attached to Swansea. Um, I spend uh, quite a few minutes, in fact, too many every day. There's a Facebook page showing pictures of Swansea in the past, and I really enjoy looking at that. And I keep on thinking to myself, God, I could you know I really like to write a story about Swansea now. Um, obviously, I don't spend. So I only go to Swansea now for funerals, unfortunately. But I love Swansea. I think Swansea and the Gower is are, are, are is are great places, and I can imagine some coming up with some good stories. Um, I I would be terrified. I would be absolutely a because Mark's already done it. Um, but also, you know, as I hinted at earlier, the, the, the amount of research you have to do. I mean, it, it's obviously a fascinating time because while all this kind of stuff is happening outside the country, while well, there's a kind of, obviously there's a war going on in the country, but soldiers are out fighting, you know. I mean, and I'm a sucker for any kind of war story. I'm a sucker for all those movies and that sort of stuff. But what's happening in slightly more, you know, mundane domestic situations, I think. I'd be quite interested to, to write a kind of psychological thriller um, you know, as as is very current now, but but set in you know 1943 mm. when the world was very different. Uh, but I, I I could never do it. I really couldn't. I couldn't no more do it than fly. 
No, I really couldn't. I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could. I really couldn't. I really, really couldn't. (laughs) You need to, I think knowing your limitations is kind of important in this game. No, can't do that. Yeah, fair fair enough. Fair enough. We're we're happy with the books that we've got from you, Mark. It's okay. Okay. We don't need to push you into World War II as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I I thought you were going to say, if you could write about any history, I'd love to write something in the mid-60s. I'd love to write a kind of swinging 60s you know, Michael Caine, Paul McCartney, all the, you know, oh, God, what a, like a, what a time Peter to be alive. Kind of yeah, a caper. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah have you, have you seen Last Night in Soho? Huh? Have you seen Last Night in Soho? I haven't. I haven't. No, I haven't. You need to see okay. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Audrey Hepburn, I'm thinking. I can't remember what the name of the Audrey Hepburn one is now, but it's the, the famous film, isn't it, which is the 60s. Crack Tiffany's. Uh, not breakfast at Tiffany. She did a crime one, didn't she? With someone. Gerard. 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 Or Charade. 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 Dull film. It would just be them miming different uh, films. <laughs> Charade of Lionel Blair. <laughs> Very well. Um, and this question goes to Phil. And this is from Jim. As a Moorcock fan, would you ever consider writing any speculative work, sci-fi or fantasy with elements of crime in it? My goodness me. Um, One of my readers keeps nagging me very politely to write a sort of H.P. Lovecraft style story set in Venice. Um, Like Mark, man's got to know his limitations. I don't think I could do it very well, sadly. it's a different genre. I've got no experience in writing it beyond that one page, frankly, fantastic Hawkwind review. <laughs> I, I don't think I could do it very well. Um, I love the idea of it. I love the idea of a crime story with fantastic or horror elements. Um, you could do it. It's tempting. But I worry I, do it very, I worry I do it very badly. Hawkwind have been mentioned more than almost any, almost <laughs> more than any author this evening. Hawkwind, I've got to tell you very quickly, Bill, because you'll appreciate this. So I'm in a band with a bunch of other crime writers, and we we played Glastonbury in 2019, uh, and we were on with Hawkwind, right? And their fridge was next to our fridge in the backstage <laughs> area, right? Seriously, at Hawkwind, and which, uh, which very very fridge ho- was full of drugs then, Mark. I, I couldn't possibly comment, Greg, but, all, but it was ve- a boiling, boiling hot weekend and we drank all our beer within 10 minutes, so spent the rest of the time we were there stealing beer out of Hawkwind's fridge. There's, that's the title of my autobiography. I stole the beer out of Hawkwind's fridge. Uh, if, Mark, Mark um, if it were possible, I love you even more now. That's, it. that's all. <laughs> Who knew this would be the Hawkwind panel? It ain't just the Hawkwind panel. You know, who no, you need to get on like you know the world's word. biggest Hawkwind fan is Ian Rankin, right? Who he is. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I, think I kind of did know that, yes. Yeah. Yeah, which is, he's uh, also, is, he's is it a thing Van amongst Mor- crime writers? I don't know. But it's, he's yeah. also a Van Morrison fan. I, yes, I indeed. I'd like to put in a word for Van Morrison if we're going to do that now. Okay? Uh, as, long, as long as it's not about the pandemic. As long, yeah. as, long, as, long as it's not about Van's okay. attitudes to the pandemic. Okay. Yeah, right, if you play, stop that about ten years ago. Then great. Yeah, yeah. Look at the way you trying to get in there with another question. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> You've all just gone off on one. Yeah, we've gone off on one. <laughs> gone off on one, and I, I've never actually listened to Hawkwind, and I, I'm a bit scared to admit that now. Um, <laughs> but I will definitely. Mark or Wagner, it's like. <laughs> I, will, I will definitely do that. But no, I was just going to say that. Um, thank you for your answers to the questions. They were brilliant. We had lots of chat in the chat room. Really enjoying your panel, um, and I will leave you in Barry's capable hands to finish off this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Louise. And, thank, um, you. thank you, gents. So my thanks to Mark Billingham, Philip Gwynne Jones and Mark Ellis, who've made this a particularly good event. If this happens next year, maybe we can all meet in Aberystwyth. Yes, I'm so year, looking forward to for this happening in real yeah. life. And why, the, and why the festival isn't called Killer Whales is still beyond me. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on that note, 